Hello and welcome to the first ever campaign gameplay showcase for Stronghold Warlords. As we get close to the launch, I thought it would be a good idea to start revealing more raw gameplay, giving us time to work on other secret video content and to give you an idea for how the game will actually look and play at launch. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Warlords is the next entry in our Stronghold Castle Sim series, coming to Steam later this year. The Stronghold games are all about castle building and besieging, with the RTS combat in this title taking place in several different countries across the Asian continent, including, of course, China. Today we'll be showing you a work-in-progress build of the fourth mission from our Chinese portion of the single-player campaign, which charts the rise and rule of Qin Shi Huang. If you aren't aware of Mr. Huang, one of the most influential figures in Chinese history, be sure to check out our video on the rise of the Qin Dynasty for a quick history lesson. Now before we begin, let me reiterate that this is a work-in-progress build with many graphics, sounds, and of course balancing still being tweaked ahead of launch. We're currently implementing player feedback on aspects of the game, including UI, AI, and other two-letter acronyms. So if you have any feedback, drop it in the comments below and we'll get back to you. So yes, hello and welcome to Campaign Preview 1, the first in our series of previews for the gameplay of the single-player mode in Stronghold Warlords. Today joining me is senior coder Matt Smith, who you may recognize from last week's Stronghold Sessions interview, and of course our Warlord Q&As. How are you today, Matt? Hello, yeah, I'm good. I'm good, I'm good. How does it feel to be to see the game running? <laughs> it's actual uh, gameplay. Actual gameplay rather than sort of you know, placing one thing down on the map, testing it and then <laughs> seeing if it works or not. There, yeah, actual gameplay. It's, <laughs> it's cool. It's I mean, it does look good in the trailers and it does look good in videos, but there's nothing not no substitute for just seeing the game running. Mm -hmm. For sure. So, for today's sure. Mission, so today's mission is um, a preview of the Chinese portion of our single player campaign. Um, you can of course see some of the warlords there. Um, I believe we have the mouse, um, I think it's the tiger and the horse in this map. I know we've got two economic and one military warlord. Um, yes. That, that, so that which, fit, which yeah. of the three is your favorite, Matt, if you had to pick <laughs> one? Um, well, I actually quite like, uh, out of those, quite like the mouse. Um, because he's um, he's cheap and cheerful. Uh, he's quite easy to take control of. Uh, he doesn't give you the most amount of stuff in the game, but it's yeah, he's quite you know his um, his edicts are cheap to buy. He's cheap to upgrade. But, you know, he gets the job done. Kind of an early game warlord. Yeah, yeah, and I also like the fact that we've got that kind of variety in there. Mm. Um, which, um, yeah, that's something that sort of developed over time. Um, so, yeah, we have, for example, we have the, the mouse uh, at one end of the scale and we have the dragon at the other. He is uh, far more prestigious um, and uh, his <laughs> the costs for his various features uh, reflect that. They reflect so, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think in this one we've got two mice, a pig and a tiger. So there was, those are all kind of... I'd say the pig's kind of like early to mid-game, maybe? Yeah, yeah. And the tiger's kind of just a solid, all-around, offensive military warlord, as we'll, as we'll see in a second. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Yes, two mice, a tiger, and a pig. Yeah, I think... Um, the, I'd say the tiger's a good sort of benchmark for, like you say, solid... Um, not one extreme or the other, um, but it gives you some good attack options. Um, yeah, which which was quite a, yeah, it's an important thing to add to the warlord system, you know, because we'd had we'd had similar ideas, you know, in the past games, but this is this this is the first time you'll actually be able to get other people to do your dirty work for you, um, <laughs> which is uh, which is pretty cool, and uh, and and the tiger can uh, can definitely bring it. Yeah. Because it's kind of all it's all based on the estate system from previous games, right? So whereas yeah. in the past you'd have to um, you'd have to imagine who is the lord of this particular estate, you know, nearby, whether what kind of character they are. Whereas now you've kind of got this this archetype that you can at least kind of imagine what the pig warlord looks like or what the tiger <laughs> warlord looks like. I imagine the tiger having quite flamboyant attire. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but uh, I think he's probably more worried about the sword at his side than. Than, than what true. he's wearing, I think. I aren't think. we all? Aren't we all? <laughs> but it's a flamboyant sword for sure. <laughs> 
So obviously, we're going to see later in this demo that you can take over the warlords um, in a variety of different ways. Um, and while it's worth noting that the warlord system in this um, campaign preview isn't the exact final version, uh, there will be a sl slightly different influence system for taking over warlords in the final game. Um, Matt, do you want to kind of briefly talk about the influence system and how that will differ from um, the kind of, you know, the, the warlord mechanics that people have seen in the in the gameplay video so far mm. um so the big difference uh certainly if anyone's played the demo they will have seen the you can just sort of demand obedience um uh you know, click the button and it's done the influence system now you're actually having to use your diplomacy points which you can you know generate through uh things like embassies and uh diplomatic buildings um you can use those points to almost like bid on certain warlords so and different ones will have different sort of amounts that you have to hit to be able to sort of bring them under your heel and um, again going back to what we were saying before the mouse uh requires a lot fewer than uh than say the tiger um but the key thing is is that some if somebody else wants to uh get control of them they can invest points as well so you sort of you can end up in a in a in a bidding war um mm -hmm for you know one particular one particular warlord um and you know once and you've that got working both single player and multiplayer won't mm, it? Mm, mm. i think i think we're uh adjusting it slightly uh between the, the two game modes there might be a little bit of variation in there yeah um just um because of the nature of the way they're going to be used in because you have sort of you know missions with a bit of narrative to them um, but then you have the, the, the skirmish of the multiplayer where it's, you know, you're dropped on the map yep. and it's every man for himself, as it were. Um, yeah, of course. And as in a single player, you you know, our main goal is making the single player happy, whereas a multiplayer, we have to make it, you know, fun mm. and fair for, for everyone. <laughs> so yeah, it can't yeah. be the same. <laughs> um, that said, though, you can still um, bring them under your heel by force. Yep. That is an option. Which which is what they're doing right now in the in the gameplay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think my favourite tactic is to if I have two warlords, like in this case, two warlords on my side of the the river or whatever kind of you know geographical feature is is separating me from the enemy. I like to take over one warlord by force and the other by diplomacy, and yeah. try and like because I want it I want it all right at the start. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as much as possible early on. I like the idea of being a sort of you know puppet master and. Uh, never actually, you know, sending uh, recruiting any troops myself. Just being sneaky and hanging yeah. back and and do yeah doing the work through others. But um, yeah. But one thing uh, that's there was a, a fairly recent change um, uh, that we've made is to how how uh, the sort of capturing by force works. Um, so now um, previously the you'd actually you'd kill the warlord. Mm -hmm. um, and then their estate would sort of fall to you, and and they'd respawn. Now though, we actually have them uh, bending the knee to you, uh, which is which is pretty cool. Um, I believe I believe that was a uh, community suggestion. Yes, yes. Because um, obviously we've had like you know thirty thousand people download the uh, download and play the Steam demo. Um, and you know, uh, along with that, a whole slew of feedback, which has uh, it's been great for us. Really, really, really good. We've never yeah. really done this kind of thing before. I don't think. Yeah, I mean, like it was development. no, it was something that we'd uh, that had been sort of discussed um, and experimented with a little bit, but um, we'd sort of seen pros and cons going, mm. you know, going with both methods. Um, but then we saw, yeah, as you, uh, as you sort of brought to our attention. Um, people in the community talking about this saying this we thought yeah yeah if this is if this is something people are after then um let's give it a go yeah i think i noticed it in the demo because the the sound of the lord dying is so loud <laughs> it's like it's a it's incredibly dramatic noise and um, i think it was when i was at pax and someone was playing it and that was the first person you know that i saw mentioned it and then obviously when we did the steam game festival we had a bunch of other people sort of suggesting as well so yeah it's nice when that kind of thing comes up and it kind of you know when you're working on a game every single day you kind of lose sight of these things that you know in the past we've gone to shows and had a few hundred people play the game but now we're you know we've got tens of thousands of people playing it and, and giving us feedback so it does kind of um sort of bring up those little little polish items that you can kind of you can add to the game yeah yeah 
Speaking of polish, I've just noticed we're putting down um, a console at the moment. <laughs> we do have some Voozle Factor. Mm, mm. Added Voozle Factor for the consulates and the temples coming? Consulates and the temples, yes. yes. Yeah. I think, um, I think the, the diplomats in this demo. Yeah, I think we changed his behavior a, a little bit. Because um, he's sort of got his scroll and he walks around uh, sort of issuing edicts and... and telling people what's going on and we had him previously we had him sort of going up to different buildings and doing it um, which kind of looked a bit odd that you just sort of go up to a pig farm and hear ye hear ye uh, but, yeah, so <laughs> this is like improving our diplomacy yeah so so now they sort of you've got one guy who moves between um, between the buildings between the diplomatic buildings on your estate um, and you know stands in front makes his proclamation and uh, moves on uh, it's, it's pretty cool but yes whereas the temples uh, each one will have their monk and they do go about sort of issuing blessings um, to the to the cool. to the people on your estate and um, yeah yeah it's it's, it's uh, yes voozle factor as you've uh, explained to me is the correct term yeah. for it but it's yeah it's nice seeing people it makes it feel like a living breathing village or yeah. settlement you know because we were talking about kind of like polish and all those kind of aspects of um you know adding little extra touches to the game in the sort of the later stages of development and sometimes that sometimes that can mean you know entire new models of things mm. new animations so it really is changing up until you know mm. the very last moment isn't it it's, it's 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 amazing how it kind of comes together towards the end yeah i mean what we're finding now at this point in development is we we are still adding stuff but the difference is we've got ev everything that's sort of critical or something else that de depends on uh is mm. in place but we've still got all these little areas for improvement where um they haven't been top priority because they haven't you know not having them in has yeah uh, it's not hasn't prevented someone from doing some other work. Um, yeah. So, but now we've got. All I hope no producers are watching this video. <laughs> <laughs> We're not adding anything. No, it's no, all, no, it's no. All good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so it's nice that I, I still have these little little touches in, and uh, and you know when we say we're always looking for places to polish and, and room for improvement that's not just mm. rhetoric we we genuinely are um yeah, yeah, it's, it's course, nice to be doing those yeah. i was thinking of doing a video about what all the like the, sort of the seven top things that we've changed in response to fan feedback but i don't know whether that's just kind of tooting our own horn a bit too much <laughs> <laughs> maybe i'm being too british about it <laughs> oh, there right. we go there's, a, there's the diplomat there he is there he is doing his thing yeah yeah um yeah, because that was the kind of thing where I think we did like a free build gameplay video a couple of weeks ago and they weren't quite in there and people mm. were kind of, you know, sometimes sometimes feedback's really useful and sometimes feedback just happens to be stuff that you were already planning to do <laughs> or it might even just not have made that particular build for that particular um, yeah. show. Yeah, just having that little bit of outside perspective on it can be can be really handy. So this is kind of the typical. This is this would be my typical strategy, and I believe yours as well. Turtling up <laughs> as early yep. on and as powerfully as possible. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, I, I am a fan of uh, the, 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 the sort of the smaller towers and just just scattering a few there with some archers roundabout. Rather than yeah, sort of... unfortunately, you can't do the classic stronghold tactic of literally putting twenty thousand archers <laughs> into a single tower no, no. and hoping for the best. But that hopefully this will be you know yeah, yeah. better better for gameplay and better for balance. Yeah. See, so the nice thing you're seeing there is um, making use of the, uh, the 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 orders, the edicts, um, so you can sort of compensate for things that you're maybe lacking on your estate or it means you can say okay well do you know what i'm not going to worry about building up this part of my economy i'm going to focus on something else yeah. but i'm going to get yeah. that warlord i'm going to let him deal with that for me yeah or in a mission where you know a certain resource is completely unavailable that might be your only option mm -hmm. so there are lots of interesting gameplay sort of you know ramifications for the warlord system yeah, yeah, I'm really excited sure. about it. I'm, I'm really excited to see what people think of the the overall. Because obviously, in a in a in a demo, right, we can only kind of give people 
a limited amount of you know perspective on what the kind of ramifications of adding a mechanic like that are. But um, yes. really looking forward to kind of releasing the core game and seeing what people think of it in single player, in free build, in multiplayer, in skirmish in particular, and kind of you know those kind of first few weeks of getting feedback and being able to tweak things will be quite interesting i think yeah yeah one thing i will say of note with the for those who have played the demo um there was definitely some uh, some balance changes uh, that was balanced for sort of a one shot demo to show off some things so you might find certain things uh, work a little differently come release yeah, I'll, I'll completely um, assume fault for that, to be honest. <laughs> I, I was the one saying the rocket launcher needs to, you know, just blow stuff apart. <laughs> it is pretty um, cool. And yeah, and like the original demo as well was like, I think it was like a 15 minute timer, which is obviously, you know, a quarter of how long you'd expect a, an, an average kind of RTS game to last, or maybe mm-hmm. like a third or something like that. Um, so yeah, we eventually opened it up so that the demo could be played for longer than 15 minutes, I think, for the Steam Game Fest. Um, but yeah, still, the balancing was um, was nowhere near kind of finished. So we're, we're finally in that stage now, which is nice. So Yeah. yeah. And we're, we're kind of still doing it as well. Oh, I just want to just uh, mention the X-ray <laughs> for the units behind the tower. I've just seen a good opportunity to talk about it there. Yeah. Um, that pretty- received a little bit of polish, I think, since we first showed it. Yes, I think the first the first iteration of it uh, was basically just sort of block color, um, yeah. and that yeah, it made it harder to pick things out in the middle of a fight or when there's a, a big clump. Um, yeah. So we went from the sort of solid colors to uh, what our producer calls the ready break effect, which. Uh, <laughs> ready break effect. Yes. Nice. Uh, so it's a bit of a you know only '90s kids will get this uh, reference, <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. If you're familiar with British brands of porridge, that might make sense to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice, and it does um, it does help. We've got some pretty tall buildings. Yeah, I, um, I think it does. Kind of, um, it seems like a minor thing, but a lot of um, fans of the 2D games want features in the 3d games that make them feel like the 2d games mm. and I i'm not kind of belittling that at all people want the kind of precision of you know an early rts game and um adding stuff like that means that 3d doesn't you know mean you lose troops or you get attacked by troops that you can't see mm. or um you know you put them in the wrong place or whatever so it seems like a little feature but it's it's something that kind of removes the frustration that I think a lot of RTS and having played some of the remasters of, of of other RTS games recently, it's quite clear how much how many frustrations there were in the RTS genre and there kind of mm-hmm. and there still can be today. So um, yeah, For I think sure. it's a, a small but important um, addition. Mm-hmm. So what are we doing at the moment? We're getting the pig, I believe, to send us a bunch of resources while we turtle up. Yeah, yeah. So it's focusing on the um, on the defenses, on the military. Um, and getting getting support from those those two warlords, um, which is yeah. Uh, if those are the guys you've got available, I think that's the the right play. Um, but yeah, the invasions uh, coming in, the attacking armies coming in are uh, getting uh, a bit more substantial at this point. It might be worth as well because obviously we haven't really talked about the campaign stuff yet. And in, in this in this mission, um, the goal is you know very very simple classic stronghold defeat the enemy lord once that happens you know you win the game um i think there are sort of sub sub um objectives in this one as well so you have to defend against these invasions uh, and then you have to take over the all the warlords on the map to sort of assert Mm. dominance over the region and then you have to take out the enemy lords um but will there be any other types of objectives in the main campaign i know there's some interesting stuff we've been been looking at doing that only kind of comes out in that later stage when the designer starts coming back to the programmers and says how about this <laughs> yeah yeah i mean there's um i won't you know no spoilers but there's at least one mission where it's not just the enemy troops that uh uh you have to worry about nice yeah yeah the terrain itself that's a nice little it's against yeah. you uh, awesome and obviously we'll have the um one thing we're working on at the moment is the event system mm-hmm which is going to feature not in terms of objectives necessarily, um, although it'll probably feature more in the economic um, campaign, but it does kind of affect the moment-to-moment gameplay, you know, quite heavily. Yeah, and I think we've got um, 
quite a bit of variety uh, in those this time around. Um, so I think actually it's interesting. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier: um, sort of campaign versus skirmish or multiplayer. Mm. Again, we want to make the events. We want to set them up such that you can have them at specific moments in a single-player mission. Um, yeah. Uh, but likewise, they could be things that could get you know suddenly dropped into a a multiplayer game and spice yeah. things up a bit. Um, so you've got to serve I, again those those two roles. I do think as well, like um, the warlord system is going to function fairly similarly in multiplayer to that, in the sense that you know each map you're playing. Say say there are I don't know how many maps are going to be in the final game, but say there are you know five or ten maps of the final game at launch. Um, if you have warlords, that randomizes things completely. Mm. So playing on the same map with a different set of warlords could be a completely different experience. Um, and then having events on top of that. So having all this sort of strategy sim gameplay means that you know one match can go two completely different directions <laughs> <laughs> even before you kind of get the warlords involved. And I think the warlords do kind of add a, a freshness to to starting up a new map and, um, and, and and taking things on rather than, you know, we all had our favorite maps in classic RTS games that we would just load up, crush the enemy over the course of an hour and be like, yeah, that felt great. <laughs> um, but there was never that kind of like, you know, you did, you kind of knew what you were going to expect, right? In every single, in every single map. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's fair to say. So we've nearly defeated all of the invasions. I think, They've obviously done the smart thing here and placed a single tower really far out <laughs> yes. to take out as much stuff as possible. Um, uh, and we're seeing some nice use of the uh, the, um, the, sort of the the automated arrow towers. Yep. yep. Um, which they've got there on and the right. A little cheeky fire lancer up there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Definitely best <laughs> used on the walls. I tried to use fire lancer as part of a siege the other day and it just went absolutely... I was doing a stream for... Um, an online event, and I, I thought, oh, you know what? Let's let's use some fire lances. They can't be that bad on attacking. And I'm like, no, these are definitely defensive troops. <laughs> Again, I yeah. don't know whether that's a, a balanced thing or not, but um, yeah, they're, they're much better, much better poised on top of a wall like they were in real life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, so think we've got some we've got some warlord upgrading going on. Yes, I was <laughs> waiting for that. I thought that you know, been neglected a little bit. Not uh, <laughs> not that I'm an expert, but yeah, uh, which is so what nice. happens when you upgrade an, a wall, or just for people um, don't know what you know, because obviously you use diplomacy points to do that. Yeah, so you know, once you've got control of them, as you've seen, you can ask them for you know, shipments of stuff or send attacks. But yeah, you can also upgrade them. Um, and what that'll do is uh, one of a few things. Um, it will give you uh, well. Okay, the first thing is that it, they've got a passive perk, a perk that's always there, um, and certain levels. Um, may increase that so if it's extra troop damage the more you upgrade them the more damage they'll do um if it's sort of helping with worker productivity you'll get more stuff uh, out yep. of your own workers if you upgrade so them. Are, there, are there perks sort of generally geared towards either economy or military depending on what their their archetype is yes yeah um okay. and it's generally they're geared towards making your stuff better so rather yeah. than the perks just improving what the warlord themselves does, um, you know, maybe it'll shore up your defenses or bolster your defenses, but you've got to have those defenses in place to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I think that was quite an important sort of design choice that we made was they... Um, yep. They don't so suddenly they give you like a crazy defense just because you own the turtle yeah. warlord, for instance. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, but the, yeah, all, all warlords have some sort of perk like that, um, and those do get better as you upgrade them. The orders or edicts that um, you can issue to them, um, which you know, in this playthrough you've, you've seen primarily used to get more resources, they'll improve. So maybe they'll drop off more resources, uh, they'll send uh, more reinforcements, um, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, uh, but also, along with those, uh, you can get, depending on the Warlord and their playstyle, um, mm. the option to upgrade their castle. Um, yeah. So, potentially, you know, you could build up your diplomacy points, take one of them 
over diplomatically and then or in the case of what's happening now just go <laughs> and attack them <laughs> yes yes um but that's it if i saw you were building up your army i'd you know grab the wall and be like quick you know build up yeah. build up your walls because uh, uh nick's coming so uh that's another thing you'll be able to do through the upgrade in fact yes you can see it there upgrade so, castle yeah now we're, we're finally seeing a, a military focused warlord here yes. and um, because it's RQA playing of course they have a million and one diplomacy points already <laughs> um, so they've just basically fully upgraded the tiger ward um, and yeah let's, let's, talk, let's talk a little bit about kind of what the military focused ones can do right so we've got the tiger we've got the dragon and um, a few others that can kind of do that kind of thing um, the things they can do right they can attack the enemy for you so you can launch uh, small or large attacking siege armies i believe they can build um a few of them can build siege camps as mm, well mm, yeah, yeah in their estate so you could use them as like a forward operations um you know base that's exactly it yes you've <laughs> you've yeah you've nailed it uh, that's yeah I only know base. about that term <laughs> by playing video games. <laughs> Either playing video games or serving in the army is the only way you learn the term for an operations base. Yes. Um, but yeah, so they can do that as well. Obviously, they can upgrade their mm -hmm. castles. So if you want to, you know, prevent the enemy from being able to just march an army right in and, and, and take it. I like to station some troops near each warlord just to kind of give them some kind of resistance. And um, also, top tip... Uh, you get the whole uh, your troops are under attack audio cue when that happens and it pings you on the minimap so if mm. someone's trying to do a sneaky uh, sneaky maneuver where they take over one of your warlords by uh, you know by, by by throwing some uh, some sneaky type troops or some fast attack troops at it you get that ping you can move over there straight away and kind of try and do something about it yeah um actually uh as of sort of a fairly recent change, I don't know if I'm <laughs> giving away too many secrets here, but um, with the with the sort of capture by force, um, actually uh, an opponent won't be able to take them off your hands if you have some troops stationed next to them. So you Go could ahead. send, you could you know take over a warlord and send him a, your own bodyguard to protect him. Yeah, um, and that actually. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, make it a lot harder for them to wrestle them off you. You could have like a kill team. Yeah, yeah. You could have yeah. like if you have a general maybe and like some bannermen and then either some imperial warriors or guardsmen or something like that. Just a kind of a small squad of um, you know elite troops to be able to kind of hold it hold it for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so even if the gives, warlord themselves, it gives more purpose to all those unit abilities as well because mm. it means that you know you can use them in specific scenarios that. You know, rather than just being something that makes your overall army, you know, stronger. Um, yeah, um, and I, there's a couple, yeah, a couple of examples of that that come to mind. Yeah, you, so we have the the heavily armored troops, um, and that's a new way to use them as a sort of you know bodyguard to send them out, um, yeah. or um, through sort of skirmishing and harassing, you can sort of whittle them down and and. Okay, you might you might not be able to capture them, but maybe you can prevent somebody else from using them. Uh, yeah. like sending out fast, long-range units to just generally disrupt the other guy's goings on. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's provided quite a few new gameplay opportunities like those. Yeah, and that's kind of what you want, right? If a game's mm. both sort of traditional RTS and simulation, you want both of those systems to kind of interplay in a way that. Um, makes it more interesting um, yeah otherwise sure. it's just two very separate <laughs> gameplay loops yes um I mean, one of the key things back in in the sort of the early days of the project when we were designing this is we didn't want it to just be sort of a generic land grab mm. you know whoever gets their army up builds their army up fastest and you know, yeah, goes to the nearest warlords. Will 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 just win. You know, we we wanted to make sure it wasn't as straightforward as that, um, and I think we've accomplished that. Yeah, I think a lot of people to kind of talk about RTS and say that it's quite hard to not innovate, but to kind of mix up the core RTS gameplay. Um, and I think that like the most successful RTSs recently have just they've just you know they may have been super super polished, but they've kind of just done the the same 
core thing, right? So you get these situations where you either turtle or you attack very aggressively, and those are the kind of two strategies. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's not like games that, you know, I, I know quite a lot of games have kind of strayed away from the grand strategy elements because they're just really hard to, to add. But I think that's where um, RTS kind of can grow a little bit. And um, yeah, but we're kind of, yeah. we're, try yeah. we're trying to do that while staying true to what a core RTS game is. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, and there's all the, <clears throat> you know, the classic stronghold sim elements in the mix as well with that, um, which I think gives a gives a bit of a unique wrinkle to things. Oh yeah, definitely. With the whole sort of like population system, popularity, um, the ability to buy and sell resources at the market and the armory and the stockpile. There's just yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> go, go watch, go watch one of our other videos if you uh, if you want a, a rundown of the kind of the core gameplay systems of Stronghold. Yeah, yeah. So now uh, we're on the final objective. Mm, our uh, mm. our player, our QA player, has taken over all four wards. He's just built a siege camp, as I was talking about earlier. Um, <laughs> and yeah, he's gonna he's gonna attack with the help of some fire oxen, maybe. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Classic. Historically, Historically accurate. <laughs> <laughs> We're laughing because research was done at first glance when you see a uh, <laughs> uh, an ox with uh, a bunch of explosives strapped to it. It's a little bit, a little bit crazy. A little I, th bit I think nutty, the reaction but... mostly so far has been people going, "Hmm," and then they Google it and they go, "Oh, fair enough." <laughs> <laughs> yep. They yep. Google it to check, but they're you know they're not sure about it when they first when they first see it. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's. Uh, it's definitely something a bit different to the sort of usual siege warfare. But yeah, sure. the thing I the thing I really like about the fire oxen is that you do have to handle them with care. Mm. I think was it Aaron's last he did a live stream uh, a little while yeah, ago. Yeah, he was doing the free builds, free builds. Yeah, yeah, that that uh, it literally literally blew up in his face. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah. I think I have about a 50-50% success ratio with Fire Oxen. Either they blow up halfway and um, set some of my troops on fire, or they hit the mark and absolutely, you know, dominate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of the two. It's one of the two. Yeah. Um, so he's trying to do a sneaky uh, a sneaky mm. flanking maneuver with this Fire Oxen. Yeah. So in terms of, like, map sizes very quickly, I, mm. I believe this is a medium-sized map. Um... I think so. Yes, looking at the uh, the mini map in the corner, because it's just worth saying that obviously there'll be um, small, medium, large, and extra large maps in the game, and we are going to show more of those um, yeah. as we go through. Um, yeah. Because yeah, you kind of what I like about this map is that you've got the you've got the kind of like you know sort of geographical features, but you've got a nice open field as well, so you can kind of see the formations of play there. I can imagine multiplayer this being quite good for just having you know some big conflicts out on that open field <laughs> yes and kind of yes. taking advantage of the formations the ability to have your archers at the back and protect those with heavily armored troops and all that kind of stuff because formations are something that we've never really done um in this way in a stronghold game before no no um and it does certainly make for quite an impressive sight when you when you sort of build up the, the force and they're yeah. all marching in Especially being able to control each unit individually, like as you know, as a as a sort of old school. I was going to say proper RTS, but what I mean <laughs> is like you know, an old school sort of classic style RTS. Yeah, yeah. Rather than squads. Yes, yes. Your you, you've got your micro and your macro and all that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that warlord has built a, a siege camp there, and you can basically use that as if that was your estate, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can build um, stuff from it, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, and you know, a uh, savvy opponent may go after it uh, and take it down, but you do have the potential to to, to build another one. You can see there in the in the menu, uh, it's actually disabled because you can only have one at a time. <laughs> right. Uh, I think otherwise things might get a little crazy. Yeah, where did those four hundred catapults come from? <laughs> yes. Ah, yes. <laughs> it does. It I does throw up the the question though: Is there such a thing as too many fire oxen? I don't. I don't yeah. know if I have the answer to that. But <laughs> now, I, I think I've used the term pincer attack about fifty thousand times since we announced warlords. But what we are going to see now is a bit of a pincer attack. <laughs> 
Um, but the nice thing about it is, like, you know, because you've got this forward operation space, um, you can just build the army out there. You don't have to do this thing where, you know, in loads of RTS games where you build up this massive base and, you know, you produce an army and then you have to get that army across the entire map <laughs> to get anywhere near the enemy. You can just you can just build them straight from there, which is cool. Yeah, um, and one of the, actually, uh, another sort of military ability we didn't touch on before is um, uh, sort of relief forces. Reinforcements, mm. so you can actually um, uh, get them to recruit, effectively recruit troops for you, mm -hmm. um, which will then sort of spawn there. So again, uh, it gets. See, here's a term: force projection. I believe it's called. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and and, and I, those those relief forces, um, they're not under your direct control, are they? Um. You can tell you can tell them to attack a specific enemy. There are different forms. There are different okay, forms. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. Um, so some might attack sort of autonomously for you. Yeah. Um, but others, you then might be able to take control of them to add them to your own forces. Ah, cool. Yeah. yeah. We haven't, I don't think we've featured that in um, in, oh. <laughs> in, in any demo so far. I think all we've had so far is just, uh. and of course, it's you know, it's, it's super <laughs> useful being able to send a force to attack an enemy. But um, yeah, having them just bolster your your forces, and that, again, that's something that people were kind of asking about that was already in the plans, um, mm -hmm. but just not not entirely ready to show yet. Yeah, uh, I hope I haven't. Uh... <laughs> Deprived you of a reveal there, Nick. No, that's good. That's good. I think we're getting we're getting towards sort of a nice stage in the marketing cycle where we've kind of revealed like a lot of our sort of major items. So now we can just kind of relax. The game's ready to show, so we can kind of just talk about it. Um, yeah, it's quite a nice kind of stage to be at. Really, it's all just about finishing up all those loose ends and then you know polishing the the hell out of it. Yeah, yeah. Um... So as we can see now, we've kind of got balance that's probably a bit more representative of what the final game's going to be like. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure in the demo, one rocket launcher would have taken out that tower. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, that's why I was having a chuckle. I was thinking back to uh, <laughs> previous previous balance passes. Um, yeah. Yeah, which was a hell of a lot of fun. Um, but uh, <laughs> probably didn't uh, lend itself to you know, longevity. Uh, yeah. Gameplay wise. So, I guess, like, just because you know, we're kind of getting towards the end of the demo now, it's mm -hmm. probably just worth mentioning, you know, a few things people can expect to change between now and launch. So, obviously, we've got uh, the influence system, which will mm -hmm. show off, you know, when it's ready, when we've had an art pass on that and it's ready to show. Um, the UI is going to obviously get finished at some point because this is kind of just you know, demo UI that we put together functionally. And you can see a few updates to it. Like you've got the little um, icons next to each building type so you can see what they produce. So that's just, you know, much easier. Um, but all that kind of black space is going to be filled out. Um, and you'll see a few sort of minor sort of uh, changes and additions to the UI based on a lot of the feedback we got uh, from the Discord community in particular. Um, we solicited feedback for that directly, so uh, that will be changed. Um, I can't really think of anything else. Obviously, like, you know, more visual factor, <laughs> more sort of graphical polish. There are some models that we, we haven't shown yet, obviously, some units that we haven't revealed, uh, siege weapons we haven't revealed, um, and, you know, uh, other types of models in the game that are kind of still going to be added to it. Um, but I don't know, can you think of anything else to sort of point out, to sort of bear in mind? Obviously, there's the occasional bit of uh, localization tags to be added <laughs> once, once or twice around here but um. yes yes um i think i mean i know i have i still have a few uh visual improvements um yeah on my on my docket um yeah again well, is, just for everyone that doesn't know matt's kind of our matt is the shader person at firefly <laughs> so any graphical that's, shaders yeah, any nice yeah. graphical shaders that we added to the game that's that's 99 percent sure to be matt <laughs> yeah, the outlines, um, uh, even um, getting the walls to follow terrain, that's that's all done. Uh, not entirely, but uh, yes, a large part of that's done uh, through that. I've, that I've only learned really what graphical shaders you know, were in the last few years. It's amazing what you can do with a shader. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I enjoy working level. on them because you, you plug in a bunch of maths and you... Uh, and you get something that looks nice out of it. That's pretty. It's pretty fun. Yeah, too. and everyone goes, "What artist did this?" And you went, 
not <laughs> artists, my friend. <laughs> it's all just numbers. Yes. Yeah. Numbers and equations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's uh, so yeah, the, and there's um yeah, there's a couple more things along those lines. Um, cool. And a bit well, of pizzazz. We're, we're getting towards the end of the video now. Um, mm. I can see that uh, we're about to swarm the uh, tower. So thank you very much, Matt. Um, My pleasure. We will, I'm sure, talk to you again in a future video um, as we go through more campaign previews. So that was your first look at some campaign gameplay for Stronghold Warlords. Matt and I hope you enjoyed this look at our current build of the game. And remember, if you have any questions or feedback, you can join the Stronghold Discord, where we both hang out during the week and talk to players. If you're looking forward to the launch of Stronghold Warlords, you can, of course, head on over to the Steam page and give the game a wishlist. Every wishlist is a huge help to us as developers, and it will also notify you exactly when the game comes out, with any special extras or discounts available at launch. We will of course be doing more campaign preview videos in the coming weeks and months, as we build towards release on Steam later this year. So if you liked today's video, be sure to give us a like and subscribe to Firefly Studios on YouTube for more Stronghold Warlords and Roman's Age of Caesar goodness every month.